why all these symptoms happen and you know, how you can explain this. The condition in Addison's disease, you have uh, underproduction in the hormones in all three layers. But what you really see in symptoms is that you have a change in blood pressure. The blood pressure is probably going to be low because you're not reabsorbing the sodium. So you can't hold the water. Even if you have ADH and reabsorb the water, you don't have the sodium to hold it in the extracellular fluid. So it's either going to go right back out through the filtration barrier and into the urine, or it's going to collect in tissues and you've got edema. You've got nutrient problems because you don't have the cortisol from the zona fasciculata. So you've got blood glucose problems. You also have um, some other conditions that aren't mentioned here. In Addison's disease, they get a bronzing. Um, skin. So you have to remember back to when we talked about where does ACTH come from? ACTH comes from a huge protein, a pre-pro-hormone. And this is broken up into ACTH, melanocyte stimulating hormone, and then also your endorphin and actually encephalins, but they act like endorphins, and your beta lipoprotein. You can kind of forget that for now, but MSH, what does MSH do? Melanocytes. Stimulates melanocytes. So your skin starts to turn brown, even though it's not exposed to a lot of sunlight. So a person with Addison's disease is going to have a brown color to their skin, but they're not spending a lot of time out there sunbathing. So it's a... It's, and it, Turns out it's not really the same type of brown that you get with sun exposure. It's a little bit bronzier, um, more like Rodin sculpture than a uh, nice tan. So there was one summer I was sitting at home, vacation time, practicing piano and watching my favorite medical mystery show. And this lady was the story was this lady had just moved to somewhere in the South America, um, South, Southern United States, New Mexico or Arizona, I forget where. But she was very photosensitive, so she didn't spend a lot of time in the sun. But her neighbors had a horse farm, and so she liked horses, so they asked permission if she could go and pet the horses and give them carrots and sugar. So she's be out there for about 15 minutes a day just petting the horses and feeding them. But then she noticed she's getting this really bronze color. And she thought, well, isn't that cool? Because I never had a tan all my life and now I'm getting this bronze color. Then she started to notice that she craved salt. And she was eating, she was salting everything. And her boyfriend said, you know, some people put salt in their beer. Why don't you put salt in your beer? So she did. She really liked that. She still craved more salt. So she was taking little box of rock salt to work with her. And she was snacking on the rock salt during the day. And that's pretty darn abnormal. You sit there and eat rock salt. But then she started noticing that she was having muscle cramps. 
really severe muscle cramp spasms. And so this, all the symptoms started to mount. So she first she saw bronzing, then she saw salt, salt craving, so sodium craving, and then muscle cramping. That's my short for muscles. Everything can be explained with what's happening due to the adrenal cortex. So bronzing, the ACTH stimulates, well, the melanocyte stimulating hormone causes the bronzing. ACTH is going to be stimulating the glucocorticoids. She didn't notice anything directly. Um, she didn't test herself. She didn't get tested for diabetes or adrenal diabetes. She can't think of anything directly that was related to the cortisol effect, except that she was just irritable all the time. But you kind of think, well, if she had muscle spasms all the time, that would be enough to be causing her to be irritable. So that those kind of symptoms, you, you've got to kind of work it out. But the fact that she was craving salt, without aldosterone, you can't reabsorb the sodium. With no reabsorption of sodium, what's happening to potassium? What? It's building up inside. It's building up inside. So you're not you're not reabsorbing sodium. That means you're not secreting potassium. So potassium is not going out at its regular level. So it's building up in the extracellular fluid. What does the cells say? Excitable cells say when potassium gets high outside. It says what? Well, it could send water out there, but before that, well, probably that's going to happen first, yeah. But then what does this, what also happens with that high potassium outside? Potassium is really low outside. It's only 5 millimolar outside, 150 inside. So just a little increase in potassium outside is not going to pull a whole lot of water out of the cell, but what is it going to do to the inside of the cell? It's going to depolarize the cell. Why? How can an increase in potassium outside cause the cell to depolarize? Huh? What's happening to what gradient? You're right, it's a gradient. What gradient? Gradient for what? It's an electrical gradient, but it's not really an electrical gradient that you're messing around with with potassium. Concentration gradient. So concentration gradient for what? Potassium. Potassium normally does what? Leaves the cell. If there's more potassium outside than normal, what happens to that leaking of potassium? It slows down. So less potassium leaves, inside the cell gets positive, and it depolarizes. All that has to be happening is that the inside gets more positive than the outside, right at the plasma membrane, you've got depolarization. That explains the muscle cramps. Okay, so muscle cramping due to the fact that you're not secreting potassium. Once potassium builds up enough, potassium itself will cause aldosterone to be released. But we've got insufficient aldosterone release. So we have nothing that the 
increase in potassium in the extracellular fluid can stimulate because we've got an adrenal cortex problem. So everything that this lady had, the salt craving, the muscle cramping, and the bronzing, all can be explained by this Addison's disease. It took four or five doctors who remain nameless because they're idiots. They never name the idiot doctor, they just have Dr. X. And then she had to go through about five doctors till she finally found a doctor who simply remembered Physiology 301 and knew about Addison's disease. And he says, oh, I know what your problem is. So let's rule out. What did he have to rule out? He had to rule out secondary adrenal insufficiency. You had to look at the hypothalamus and you had to look at the anterior pituitary to make sure that the reason she was having all these symptoms was due to the adrenal gland and not something upstream. But really what he, he didn't really, as far as I was concerned, didn't really have to look at the upstream because he has bronzing which links to ACTH and MSH and with the salt craving and everything there's there's nothing <coughs> upstream that controls the salt craving so I didn't think he had to but by law he has to rule out the others because um, and also because of his liability insurance has to rule out the other things, but he came up with the diagnosis of primary adrenal cortical, um, cortical, adrenal cortical insufficiency or Addison's disease. It's called medical mysteries. And most of them, uh, well, some of them truly are medical mysteries, but some of them are just, you didn't pay attention in basic anatomy, you know, physiology, because these are not mysteries. They're very explainable with this level of knowledge. Okay, adrenal medulla is postganglionic nervous system. They don't have, these cells don't have long axons but they're releasing epinephrine and norepinephrine and they're stimulated by preganglionic uh, sympathetic nerves. So these are postganglionic neurons modified because they don't have axons. That's their modification. Other than that, they're just like other postganglionic neurons that they're going to be releasing in the nervous system, it's primarily norepinephrine, but these cells have one more enzyme so they can take norepinephrine, convert it to epinephrine. And with the fact that you rarely stimulate your adrenal medulla, most of the norepinephrine has already been converted to epinephrine. And so when you stimulate the adrenal medulla, majority of what's released is already converted to epinephrine. And then the remaining um, neuro, um, hormone that comes out will be norepinephrine. There wasn't time to convert it all the way to epinephrine. The numbers will vary from text to text, 80 to 85%. So this number will be varying from 15 to 20%. <coughs> epinephrine backs up the autonomic nervous system's recruitment of target organs via norepinephrine release from the sympathetic nervous system. So epinephrine in the circulation and that 20%, 15-20% of norepinephrine that's released will bind to the same receptors on the same post, um, the same target cells that norepinephrine binds to in the body and keep those cells responding as though the nervous system was continually being, was continuing to send out action potential. But the nervous system doesn't have to do that. It only has to do it long enough to get things started. And then epinephrine and norepinephrine will start arriving via the blood 
They will continue to arrive for a long period of time and continue maybe for a day or even up to weeks having the target tissue respond to the hormone. The nervous system is on off fast. You have, as soon as the, nor the norepinephrine released from the nerves diffuses away from the receptor, the, post the target cells are turned off. Once the hormone starts arriving in the blood, it's continually arriving and its concentration will go down, but it's continuing to arrive, continuing to stimulate the target cells. So epinephrine via the blood can maintain your blood pressure. Your nervous system can contract or relax. An increase in norepinephrine release from nerves causes an increase in smooth muscle contraction. Epinephrine arriving maintains that smooth muscle contraction. Epinephrine backs up cortisol and glucagon to keep blood glucose levels high for these fight or flight responses. And it does so primarily by mobilizing fats from your adipose and not attacking your skeletal muscle, but it could do that as well. So stress is pretty non-specific term. What is stress to you? You might consider something that I consider is like nothing. It might be very stressful to you, and it might be the opposite, that I get really stressed out by something, and you think, it's a problem. It's not stressful. It's a subjective thing. It's a subjective term. But whatever is your stressor is going to stimulate the, this stress response, which is elevate cortisol, so you handle the stress better, to elevate epinephrine release, to elevate glucagon release, and all of those synergistically maintain your blood glucose concentrations. The, so stressors will increase sympathetic release of epinephrine from the adrenal medulla that is some, sometimes just the stress before the actual fight or flight, just knowing that there might be danger out there, that that saber-toothed tiger might be around the corner because he's been seen in the vicinity and you just don't know. Or the water is murky and you're going in surfing anyway, there might be sharks there, you just don't know. So those kind of stressors, you're already releasing the epinephrine. You see the fin, it might be a dolphin fin, but you see the fin and you paddle in like mad. Or you see some movement over there around the corner and you just assume that's the tiger and you better run the other way. So you have pre-release of epinephrine which gets your nervous system geared up for the fight or flight response. And then when you actually have the response, then you have the nervous system trigger a large recruitment of all of the target cells, and then you have the adrenal medulla releasing epinephrine and norepinephrine that will continue to keep those cells stimulated for as long as you need to, and probably beyond the point that you actually need to. So TRH release, ACTH, and 2-cortisol, this is referred to as an axis probably because of the feedback loops that are involved, the kind of spiraling around this, pictorially around this central bunch of words. I'm not really sure why they call it an axis, to be quite honest, but I'm, I suspect it's probably because of those feedback loops that they, they drew and then just decided to call it an axis. So elevation of blood glucose, fatty acids, to and glucagon to keep your glucose levels high. To do that, you also have to, when glucose is high, you have to shut off insulin because glucose concentration is elevating 
will cause beta cells to depolarize. They'll bring that glucose in and make ATP out of it and then set off a depolarizing <coughs> reaction within the beta cell. And what, so what happens in the beta cell, we have high glucose out here. Glucose comes in. In glycolysis, you make ATP, ATP phosphorylates a channel that closes with phosphorylation, so PI on it closes a potassium channel. So what happens? What happens when if you closed the channel that potassium leaks out? You depolarize the cell. So potassium starts to build up because it's not leaking out, and that depolarization then opens channels that allows calcium to come in. Calcium comes in, vesicles full of insulin. Now come to the membrane, stop, and then insulin is exocytose. <coughs> So blood glucose, normally when it goes up, you get insulin release. So with the stress response, you've got to shut off insulin release and get glucagon high. Even though blood glucose levels are high, you've got to get glucagon high, epinephrine high, and cortisol high. Other thing with fight or flight, you've got to maintain that blood pressure to keep the blood that now is diverted out to active skeletal muscles, you better keep the blood pressure high enough to keep the blood going to the brain to keep you aware of what's going on. So blood volume and blood pressure have to increase, and that's via the RAAS system, which is uremic angiotensin aldosterone system. So your kidneys look at blood pressure, See blood pressure going down, they release renin, which then, this is an enzyme, stimulates angiotensin, angiotensinogen, synogen, conversion to angiotensin 1. Now it's short, so you can read it. Good. Cleaves off the ogen part. You have angiotensin 1, and that goes to your lungs, and it becomes angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 comes back to the adrenal cortex. Aldosterone comes out. That comes back to the kidneys and you reabsorb sodium. Angiotensin 2 goes up to your posterior pituitary. And stimulates ADH release. ADH comes back to your kidneys and now you reabsorb water. So blood pressure, sodium, and water, they're now in your extracellular space. Your blood pressure is now high. That's the renin and detensin aldosterone system. More about the actual communication next semester. So metabolism, Metabolism is chemical reaction in every single cell. If you break bonds, that's catabolism. If you make bonds, that's anabolism. So the bolism part. That's your metabolism. So breaking a bond, you are doing a, 
a degradation reaction, anabolism, you're making a bond, you're doing a synthesis reaction. That's all your metabolism. The inter intermediary metabolism of your fuel, uh, that's what we're, this catabolism and anabolism refers to. So catabolism here, anabolism there. When you transform proteins into amino acids, you're doing catabolism, but when you take amino acids and you make proteins, then that's anabolism. Stringing carbons together to form fats or stringing free fatty acids onto glycerol, that would be anabolism, and then mobilizing your energy stores would be catabolism. Taking carbohydrates from a starch to a monosaccharide or any intermediate up to their dextrans or um, disaccharides, that would be catabolism, forming gl glucose, um, sorry, glycogen in your body, that would be anabolism. This looks kind of complicated, but if you take it step by step, it's not so bad. So here we've got our stressor again. At the hypothalamus, just the stressor itself can cause the posterior pituitary to release a little more vasopressin. Vasopressin, also known as ADH, or antidiuretic hormone. So it causes reabsorption of water, which is its ADH part, but it also causes the blood the smooth muscle and the blood vessels to constrict, so vasoconstriction. So reabsorb water and then also um, cause the vascular system to get a little bit smaller so blood pressure is more easily maintained. The conservation of salt comes in well, not directly from vasopressin, but from the angiotensinogen, angiotensin 2, that stimulates vasopressin. So down here, angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, that feeds uh, into the kidneys for reabsorption of sodium. So similar release, releasing factors. The sympathetic nervous system will stimulate the adrenal medulla to release epinephrine. That's fight or flight. Sympathetic nervous system directly contracts smooth muscle via norepinephrine. Epinephrine binds to the same receptors and causes smooth muscle contraction. The that in decreases the size of your vascular system and helps to control your blood pressure. The um, sympathetic nervous system stimulates the glucagon secretion, can inhibit the insulin secretion, so now you've got epinephrine and glucagon high. You have, you'll have cortisol coming from this pathway, but just epinephrine and glucagon together, they act synergistically, and one and one is now three or four instead of two. Insulin is suppressed the, by the central nervous system. Hypothalamus releasing CRH, releases ACTH, which causes cortisol to come out, and cortisol will work with epinephrine and glucagon, again, to mobilize energy and get it converted to glucose. So epinephrine, well, we'll pick up with this on Wednesday, and 